The wide world of Stephen King adaptations is a bit of a grab bag. Here we've discussed an 80s entry directed by the man himself. I just wanted someone to do Stephen King right. As well as a TV version of one of his most loved books and films. Though that Kubrick film is famously one of his least favorite adaptations. Well, I didn't really like the movie that much. The book was warm and the movie was cold. And don't get me wrong, I love everything else the man did. I just didn't like that one. We've hit upon some other 90s adaptations, as well as opened the curtain into the 2000s. We have so much more to cover, as his stories have been made into movies in six different decades now. Today, we are taking another dive into our beloved 90s, and looking at a movie that is both forgotten and seen differently, depending on which version you've watched. For my money, 90s King adaptations are the strangest decade of all that we've seen. They started off about as hot as you could with the Rob Reiner Misery adaptation netting its lead actress an Oscar, and the film itself being one of the most beloved adaptations of his work. However, you can look at the decade in three sections, and when you do, you get good, bad, and forgotten. Misery came out in your graveyard shift, which we've already talked about and like it. The decade closed with Green Mile, which is a great film, and also a good introduction for younger viewers into the King universe. It was preceded by Apt Pupil, The Night Flyer, which is good, and then Thinner. Your mileage is going to vary on those three, but they're certainly not on the Mount Rushmore of King adaptations. Finally, you have that middle part of the decade, and there's an 800-pound gorilla sitting there occupying the number one spot on the IMDb Top 250 films of all time. Believe me, I know how flawed that list can be, but it's not nothing, and the movie is objectively wonderful. Floating around that film's impact are The Mangler, which is a great cast and flawed fun. Dolores Claiborne, The Dark Half, which we've already talked about, and today's entry, Needful Things. Needful Things got a quick adaptation. The book was published in 91, and this came out in August of 93. The movie got torn apart by most critics. The rest of the movie is just a waiting game until the end, when there are all kinds of stunts and special effects and exploding buildings and fireballs and all of that sort of thing, which basically, at this point, is getting pretty boring in the movie. It currently sits with a 28% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's not that bad by a mind. Sure, it's a little slow at times and has a very repetitive nature to it. <laughs> when you look past the service level stuff, it hides some absolute gems. I want to thank you guys for watching The Black Sheep and ask if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. Like this video and click the bell so you can get notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. The movie opens with a dark and sinister car traveling into the small town of Castle Rock. An outsider claiming to be from Akron, Ohio named Leland Gaunt My name is Leland Gaunt. opens the town's newest shop called Needful Things, and is the town folk buzzing about who he is and what he's all about. The sheriff, played by Ed Harris, goes into the local diner to propose to his girlfriend Polly, who is played by Die Hard's Bonnie Bedelia. Though for Stephen King aficionados, she was also Susan in Toby Hooper's Salem's Lot adaptation. The sheriff character, played by Ed Harris, is named Alan Pangborn, and that character would actually appear in the same year in The Dark Half, there played by Michael Rooker. The first customer to enter the store is a young boy named Brian. He doesn't have a lot of money for a signed Mickey Mantle baseball card, but the proprietor, Gaunt, isn't looking for cash only. He has a trade system in mind as well. Gaunt is played to perfection by screen legend Max von Sydow. His career spanned nearly six decades, but the 90s were a strange time for him. He appeared in Oscar-worthy films like Awakenings and Snow Falling on Cedars, made tons of TV appearances both here and in Sweden, including the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, and appeared in random, unexpected places like here in Judge Dredd. The cast in general is full of good performances from the likes of Ed Harris and Bonnie Bedelia, and fun, unhinged ones like J.T. Walsh. But this is Max's movie. His mannerisms, look, and especially delivery of lines are just delectable and they're creepy. Just a tiny thank you note for that remarkable pie. Gaunt's trade with the boy? He wants him to play a prank on his neighbor by smearing mud and turkey poop on her laundry. He does this and the neighbor Wilma assumes it was done by Nettie Cobb, who works at the diner and also has a dog that Wilma absolutely hates. I'm gonna get you for this, you understand? You and your mom! She's a good doggie! 
Gaunt does this one by one with the members of the town, trading things they want or need from their former lives for a nefarious task that he wants them to accomplish. For Nettie Cobb, he trades a porcelain doll for her willingness to spread notes all over the house of town selectman Danforth Buster Keaton, implicating they know about his gambling debts. He trades a replica letterman's jacket to Hugh Priest in return for the murder of Nettie's dog. This goes on and on in the hopes of creating chaos. Every time he makes a trade with someone, he writes their name in a little black book under the name of the town. We also spot that this isn't the first place he's done this, and I'm guessing it's not going to be the last. Sheriff Pangborn discovers that Danforth has borrowed 20000 from the town petty cash to pay off gambling debts. I've been having some bad luck at the track lately. Borrowed some money from the town petty cash fund just to cover the shortfall. And Gaunt tells Brian he's not quite done. He needs him to throw apples through Wilma's window to complete the task. Between this and the murder of Nettie's dog, the two women meet at Wilma's house and end up stabbing and killing each other. Alan doesn't think it's all adding up, and the rest of the town seems to be having feuds within their ranks as well. One of the things this film does really well is creating a dark atmosphere that arrives at the same time as Gaunt. People get grumpier with each other, angrier with each other, and then pranks, as Gaunt calls them, begin to send the townsfolk over the edge. The dialogue and script in general are written well by W.D. Richter, who in addition to writing my personal favorite film, Big Trouble in Little China, God, no, please, what is that? Also wrote the Frank Langella iteration of Dracula and the Don Siegel remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Hell, he even directed the cult classic Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai. You, Mr. Richter, are okay in my book. The other creative end that sits behind the camera is director Fraser C. Heston. At first glance, you'll see that he's known as the baby in the Ten Commandments. But he's also legendary actor Charlton Heston's son. Almost all of his credits are with his father in some way. And it's a shame that Needful Things is the only one of two theatrical films he ever directed, as he does a pretty good job here. Gaunt, already very pleased with what he's done to the town, turns his attention toward the arthritis-afflicted Polly and gives her a necklace that will ease the pain. Oh. While we don't see what he wants her to prank in return, we get the feeling he is only doing to cause a rift between Polly and Alan. Danforth is now completely paranoid and tells Gaunt that he will kill the deputy, but Gaunt talks him down, takes his gun, and plants the seed that Pangborn is the real threat. Still at the crime scene, Alan's trying to figure out what really happened when Brian is just about to tell him what he did, he runs off in fear instead. Alan later confronts the boy who is threatening to shoot himself with Danforth's gun. He's able to stop him, but Brian still ends up in the hospital, and Alan is visibly shaken. Apparently, the original script, and I think even what they shot at first, had the boy not surviving. But they decided to change this as it might have felt like a bit too much. Getting the overwhelming gut feeling that Gaunt is evil, Alan asks Polly to remove the necklace, and when she does, her hands become crippled instantly. Ah! Gaunt reappears and seduces her with power before accepting 20 bucks and a small favor in return for the necklace to be replaced on her and working again. We see Father Meehan slash Hugh's tires, which sets Hugh on his own path of destruction, assuming it was the bartender who kicked him out multiple times for getting too drunk and assaulting the jukebox. He goes to Gaunt, who gives him a shotgun and sets him on his way. Hugh and the bartender fatally shoot each other, while across town, Alan and his deputy Norris subdue the now insane Danforth, and then Polly calls Alan and tells him she found the money he supposedly embezzled along with Danforth. One of the small issues I have with this, and it's also part of the book, is there's just too many storylines going on. Now in a novel, you can jump back and forth or have different chapters talk about it, but in a two hour film, it's hard to pack that many characters in, and sometimes it can be a little overwhelming. Alan is of course innocent, and this is merely another prank set up by Gaunt. Pangborn goes to the church to ask Father Meehan if the devil could be real before the church explodes and Father Meehan assumes it was the work of Reverend Willie Rose. It's a goddamn Baptist! Who has the other congregation in town. At this point, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> and Danforth is even able to escape. J.T. Walsh now becomes the other standout of the film here until the end, with insane actions, dialogue... You're handcuffed to the door. Aren't you the fucking genius? ...and facial expressions to show how far his character has gone. While he was a short-tempered, kind of evil character before, he is now Looney Tunes level of insanity, and I am all for it. I killed my wife. Is that wrong? The way Gaunt manipulates him These things happen. gives Max von Sydow even more ownership of his role, and the two share some awesome scenes together. I just wanna die, please! I just wanna die! I won't disappoint you. 
I promise. Danforth ends up killing his wife, and just when the town is about to fall apart, illustrated by the two religious leaders locked in mortal combat, Finish. Fuck you! Alan is able to talk some sense into the people of the town. Oh! He gives the people back their humanity and sanity in a pretty impassioned speech. He's got us all lined up like a bunch of human fuse boxes! Don't you see what he's done? You're done here, God. Just as he finishes, though, he's shot by Danforth, who comes out to take the whole town with him, strapped to the nines with explosives. Alan does a good job talking him down before Gaunt calls him Buster a few too many times in a scene that is sort of a bizarro version of Creepshow's Tell It To Call You Billy. With whatever sense he has left, Danforth pushes Gaunt into the Needful Things shop and the entire building goes up in flames. Just as Alan and Norris approach the wreckage, however, Gaunt comes out with not a single scratch on him. And one more good line, telling Alan he will see he and Polly's grandson in 2053, where they'll have quite the party. He then drives away in his car to cause trouble in some other small town. Like a lot of adaptations from Stephen King, Needful Things is a bit of a mixed bag. It has a ton of different storylines going and doesn't have the time to commit to them all. Well, at least in the theatrical release. After watching this again, I felt like I was having fake memories of this movie until I found out that TBS slash TNT commissioned the director to make a four hour TV edit. You get to see a ton more of the characters' interactions and motivations, as well as more Leland Gaunt, which is never a bad thing. Who the fuck are you? Who the fuck are you? Sadly, this version's only ever officially appeared on a German Blu-ray release. But if you hunt, and it won't take that long, you can find it. You can do far worse for Stephen King adaptations, especially in the 90s. So grab a drink, set aside two hours, and prepare to enjoy A Tale of Chaos. Three. For a small favor. Who are you? I'm a damn turkey! Oh, yeah.